Believe it or not, just an hour ago it was raining, but now it's beautiful. We have a great show for you. We're going to talk about smallmouth bass fishing. We're going to take you on a sporting clays course, a great way to get ready for hunting season. We have a recipe. Hey, a lot more. This is the last of our summer series. I'm Fred Trost. It's time for the Practical Sportsman. Last week, Charlie Keenan suggested we try Lake Skagamog west of Traverse City for smallmouth bass. Skagamog is famous for big muskies, but the rocky bottom and clear water is also ideal spawning habitat for smallmouth bass. As we were running to the narrows between Skagamog and Elk Lakes, the graph showed a firm gravel and sand bottom that came up at the narrows to 10 or 12 feet. We'd fish that later, after we tossed a few spinner baits around the logs at the north end. This lake chain is actually a flooding, so some areas have a lot of logs and dead trees in the water, places where fish like to hang around. Well, the technique here that I'm using is a little beetle spin. It's a spinner bait. It goes through the water like that and spins on top, and this little grub attracts them. Single hook. But the nice thing about this, it bounces over the logs and the twigs so it doesn't get hung up like a treble hook would. I'm using four pound test line, a little ultralight spinning rig, and just casting randomly because these logs, this is all flooded, so there are logs all over the bottom. And wherever I cast, there's a chance of picking one up. Oh, there we go. Probably a little bass. It looks nice. Well, it isn't huge. Oh, oh, that's the fun of smallmouth bass right there. I love it when they jump. Oh, that's a good fighter. Yeah. Oh, this four pound test line is great. Oh, that is a scrappy one. Oh. Oh, you got one too? <laughs> Outstanding. Tell you what, I'm not uh, I'm not milking this. It just doesn't want to. Oh, this is a riot. What a slight tackle. That was about the fourth cast. <laughs> he isn't done yet. There we go. Smallmouth bass. They're one of the classiest fish in the water, the smallmouth, and many anglers use nothing but artificial bait to catch them because artificials are rarely swallowed. They tend to hook the fish in the lip where the hook can be removed and the fish return to fight another time, sometimes the same day. Time for an alternative rig. Now this is for smallmouth bass. A lot of them are too small we just want to hook them in the corner of the mouth. I'm using a small hook with a short shank, hooking the night crawler once. And I'm not going to use a bobber because I don't want the bass to have that much time to swallow it. So what I'm going to do is just use this ultralight, throw it out there, be watching the line, watching how it's peeling out, uh, sinking in the water. And as soon as the fish grabs it, wham, set the hook. With no bobber or no sinker, the night crawler floats freely, looking like a worm that's lost its home. A tasty and easy meal for a fish. I watch the angle of the fishing line to the water. Here you can see the worm isn't sinking. Something's grabbed it and is swimming away. The line also strips off the reel faster than normal. The line's peeling out. That worm isn't swimming that fast. There we go. This is a fun way to fish. Just happens to be very productive today. I set my drag lightly so if the fish makes a run, it won't break the line. It's right on the edge of pulling my drag. That's the eater. I turn back most bass, but I've started a new policy this year. I'm always going to keep at least one small fish to eat, and this is the one. Well, you know. When they're down in the water, they look a lot bigger. <laughs> That's what the deal is. 
That's about the same size. I don't know though. I want one to eat. I'm going to treat myself to a smallmouth. They are terrific eating. See, they're a cousin to the, very closely related to bluegill, actually, more so than largemouth bass. And they're very tasty. Doggone. The membrane inside there, look, look, it's hardly hooked at all. The hook is barely in there, but their mouth is so tough. It doesn't take much to hold a hook in a bass's mouth, but sometimes they're tough to unhook. So I thought I'd try something I've never tried with live bait, a barbless hook. I used pliers to pinch the barb down, and the night crawler slid on easily, so I hooked it twice and threaded it up onto the shaft. I was kind of concerned it would come off. But I was also concerned a bass would get hooked deeply if it swallowed the crawler, which is why I tried to set the hook right away as soon as I see the line moving. Got one working on it. There we go. Yep. Doesn't seem like a real big one. In fact, it seems like a real small one. Well, not bad. Oh. oh, we're getting back into the better ones. By setting the hook right away, I didn't have a problem with bass swallowing the hook. They were generally hooked right where I wanted them, on the lip. Now, that's whether I used a conventional hook or pinched off the barb. But artificial lures are still the favorite of most bass pros. <laughs> he isn't dumb yet. I like that. I like that in a fish. Oh, that's a nice fish right there. Mm -hmm. Compared to worms or minnows, artificial lures are low maintenance. They don't have to be fed or kept cold, and you don't have to wash off your hands after you touch one. But in many circumstances, not always, but often, live bait will outperform artificials when it comes to catching more fish. The bigger hooks on artificials are easier to remove, but by pinching down the barb and by setting the hook quickly, you can use a crawler and still hook most fish in the lip. Which fish will I keep to eat? Not a big one. Charlie, I'm going to keep this one. Keep that one. We'll keep that one. I'm going to eat that. We're going to fry that up within 24 hours. That's my new rule for this year. I'm going to keep an eater, at least one eater, and I'm going to eat it within 24 hours. Catching lots and keeping one, that's what I call a perfect fishing trip. If you're a hunter, it's good to practice with your shotgun before you go hunting, and a great way to do it nowadays is that terrific shotgun game called Sporting Clays. My first introduction to a new shotgun game, it's called Sporting Clays. It's done on a course of different shooting stations in woods, fields, and ponds at the Grand Blanc Huntsman Club. So here we are at the first, uh, the first, first station? Yes, first station. Okay. This is where we get to be humble, or whatever. Now, who's the puller? The puller. Where? Oh, okay. you're the puller. Yeah. Where do you pull from? In the hole down here in the pit. Oh, okay. He, he gets to the first station is actually the pit from the Crazy Quail shotgun game. The puller loads the targets. His trap is on a swivel that rotates 360 degrees. You don't know what direction the clay pigeon will be going. can legally ask to see a bird if you walk to a station and none have been fired. Uh -huh. So when I walk here, I could say, could I see a bird? But that's not going to help me here. Because you already know. No, no because go anyplace. they're going to go anywhere in that area. So I can't really take and say, let me see a target, because the next one won't be there. Oh, OK. So I'm just going to shoot blind, I hope. Red Ball holds the club record for sporting clays, 43 out of 50. That made me a little self-conscious. Wow. Pull! Huh. I, I knew there was a chip coming off in that one. Sure is, sure is great to have a peanut gallery back there, I'll tell you. <laughs> Oh! There it is! All, All right! right. Oh, do I feel much better now. <laughs> <What>? Congratulations! <laughs>
After the first station, I'd only hit one out of four. They said a good score for anyone is 25 out of 50. The next station is harder. It's called doubles on report. And it's something you'll encounter in the grouse woods where the bird flushes, you fire a shot. And at the sound of your shot, the second bird gets up. And that's what you're gonna have here. The first hmm. bird will go out between the two far trees. At the sound of your shot, another trap will throw a target. Still right to left crossing, but it'll be much closer to you. Okay. It's gonna be tricky. You're first this time. I am first. Okay. This is the victim. We got him. <laughs> and he's ready. Now. Pull it! In slow motion, you can see Pat Burke's shot. It breaks the clay pigeon in half. At the sound of his shot, the second pigeon is thrown in a little different direction. He smokes this one. You can see it through the trees in the middle of your screen. A perfect hit. Nice pair. Nice pair. These are the traps right, used for this on. station. Sometimes they mix in different sized and different color clay pigeons just to add variety. Ooh, hoo, hoo. All right, here's the man of the hour. Gonna Doubles. No problem here. Paul. I hit this one, but it came apart behind the tree. But I was so thrilled with myself, I almost forgot there was a second target on its way, but I split that target with just a couple pellets. Oh, oh, oh. oh do I feel better. Hey, you got the record, that's three. That's right. <laughs> Shooting skill is the biggest part of sporting clays, but I found that red special 1,350 feet per second loads with extra hard shot breaks targets faster and easier. Ready. Pull that. You can actually tell in slow motion that the shot reaches the pigeon faster. You can see the shot string and the wad. Red second shot was low and behind. It's really apparent on videotape why shots miss. Because of the speed of this game and the unpredictability, a lot of misses are low and behind. If you took and cut down all these trees, so it's all wide open, through the same targets, they should be no problem at all. It's just the terrain and the trees what is what does it. Everybody's, you know, feeling closed in or whatever. I don't know. You know, a lot of, most people are used to skiing trap, which is the same mm -hmm. thing over and over. It's wide open. Oh, you'll you take and put these here. trees in the middle of a, a skiing trap barrel. here, they're going to have a heck of a time with them too. So it's trees. That's what makes sporting clay so tough. You have to pick your shots and punch the trigger just like hunting. The last stations of the course are on the pond, simulating duck hunting in a marsh. The targets come in like fast flying teal. Taking a look at this sport in slow motion is a real treat for the good hits and the misses. You can see a part of the wad flying ahead of the second bird, probably where the shot went. Red, 39, Pat, 33, Fred, 22, Tim, 23, and Everett, 23. That. 22, that's a keeper. That is that a keeper. Is a Congratulations. Your first, first time, that is really good. <laughs> well, my score wasn't great, but what fun I had. Sporting Clays, the Grand Blank Huntsman Club, Wednesdays and weekends, a great way to practice shotgunning in Michigan outdoors.
I'm trying to be gentle about this, scooping out these critter crepes onto the plates here. These are a crepe, I guess. What is it, Bill? It is uh, wrapped in some sort of, it's something like a tortilla, isn't well, it? Well, no, it is an actual crepe. I mean, you can I mean buy a crepe, some... what is a crepe? Oh, it's a, a, a very thin French pancake. Um, and then the uh, and inside is, I call them critter crepes because you can use any type of critter, like, you know, I've got the too much gun type thing. Yeah, but I mean, you're talking... Then there's always the roadkill. Yeah, you know. small game. Yeah, any small game. Like that. And uh, and you have brought with you, I mean, every time for years, all the times you've been on the show, you've brought your wife, whose name is? Debbie. Debbie. Yeah, Behind the scenes, Debbie, who's who gets to help Bill out on all these things. And Debbie just reamed me out for making a mistake that I have said on this show for years and years. And what is it? Don't it's, make me huh? say it. Don't make me nope. say it. It is, what I've said is William Wiswell, right? Right. And it's pronounced with a Z. Wiswell. Right. I will never make that mistake again. And I'm sorry. <laughs> but you didn't phonetically spell it out for me. <laughs> and you didn't, you waited all these years, Bill. Well, I was just waiting for the wife to take care of it. Uh-oh. You're going to get yourself <laughs> in trouble saying that. Okay, back to the critter crepes. So you buy this French pastry, and you have... Well, um, I made this. Oh, you made it? Yeah. Do you get to cook at home at all? Some. <laughs> Some? Because I yeah. tell you, these concoctions are great. This wrapping, this this crepe wrapping is outstanding. Mmm. Well, you know, it's got, you know... Broccoli in it? Broccoli in it, mushrooms. Um, what, what kind of cheese is on the top? It's a... Sh well, it's a sauce made with milk and flour. Mmm. And uh, there's wine, white wine in it, but Ooh, the, I can the, taste the, it. Well, you, there's no alcohol in it because mm -hmm. it all cooks out. Um, but there's uh, sharp American cheese in it. Hmm. This is awesome, awesome critter crepes, Wiswells. Right. <laughs> I stand corrected, but the recipes, as usual, this recipe is terrific. Oh, here we have a dog that <laughs> people are going to say, that's no hunting dog, that's a house dog. Well, yeah, she's both. She's both. Her name is Jenny? Penny. Penny. Penny, the golden retriever who's nine years old, who's been trained by Gordon Lucart from Jenison, yep. Grand Rapids area. Now, Gordy is not a professional trainer, are you? No, I'm not. That's the beauty of it all. That's... Now, you put your dogs through obedience training? I do it myself start them as a pup and you you work to get them to come sit and stay the basic commands and then everything else works off from that well i know carol she takes it to some some real extremes if you want to get into some you know high level obedience training and you will be here to talk about sporting dogs because carol doesn't work you know with sporting dogs particularly now penny is nine years old you have her trained to hand signals yes why don't we just demonstrate right now gord can show you what he's done by you say just reading a few books and Yes. Learning your look at what he's done. Mark. So you throw that dummy out there, it disappeared over the hill. Mark. Two dummies, two different directions. Which one's she gonna go to? I'm gonna give her the line on the first one. Fetch him up. So she goes by your hand signal. Yeah, that's a line to get her going. If it was way out and in the weeds, she might have to stop and turn around and get more signals. If she got offline a little bit, you bring her to the left. Or right. She's taught to heel. come back to you, swing around, heel, and sit, and then give you the dummy? She'll hold until I tell her to give. Give? Good girl. Good girl. Now, you do hand signals, too. Yes. She looks like she forgot where that dummy is. Well, she may have. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Okay. Fetch him up. Can you stop her right there before she picks up the dummy? Come. That's good girl. Oh, so you called her back to... I knew she overran back. it. Now, that's the type of thing you do in the duck marsh when she's looking for a duck and you know where the duck is, but she gets lost in the weeds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and great. it's real important to be able to control them a little bit. Give. Will she give it to me? Yes. Give. Good Whoa. girl. Thank you. 
That's a good dog. Well, that's Penny the Golden Retriever. She always seems to take a little run around after she dumps the dummy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Gord, you did great. Thank you. He's not a professional trainer. He's not a professional TV guy, but he can still close the show the way it should be closed. Thanks, Fred. You know what to say. Oh, no. Get outdoors. Oh, get outdoors. It's a great place to be. See, that's the way it's done. Thank you, Gord. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. <laughs>